Hi, my name is Ken Condon. I'm the host of a new show, Riding in the Zone. We're going to take you on a journey into the world of motorcycles. Everything from flat track and road racing to riding the open road. We'll introduce you to people and happenings in the motorcycling community. We'll also give you insights on how to be the best rider you can be. Whether you love the speed and grace of the racetrack or the freedom of open spaces, Riding in the Zone will be a window into the wide world of motorcycling. Hi, this is Ken Condon from Riding in the Zone. Today we have somebody special in the studio. Her name is Melissa Holbrook Pearson. She's an author, journalist, and motorcyclist. Hey, Melissa. Hi, Ken. So, I really appreciate you coming in today. Always a pleasure. Great. So, how I first knew you was from your book, The Perfect Vehicle. That book really inspired me. I thought it was just a great look at sort of inspiring other people to perhaps consider motorcycles as you know, something more than just, you know, some kind of vehicle that people sort of have fun on. So tell us more about what your inspiration was for that book. It was when I started riding, I thought, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Like, why didn't I know about this before? I think it's something you have to do and experience yourself. I thought that there had to be some hunger out there for, um, you know, among people who didn't ride to try to understand why people ride, why their friends were so passionate about riding. And so I really very naively wrote this book with um, non-motorcyclists in mind because I figured, well, motorcyclists already know all this stuff. They're not going to be interested in reading it. It was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Really pretty much exclusively motorcyclists read it. And I think what they responded to was um, the corroboration of their own experience, the things that they had never put in words or seen out there on the page. Um, not, not that we need for anybody else to tell us how important writing is, mm -hmm. but um, that, they, that they saw their experience in this, in this book. And, you know, basically nobody else really yeah. cared to read it because, you know, if if you're not inside this experience, um, you don't know how big it is and how deep it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, to me, it's everything. It's, it's intellectual, it's spiritual, it's physiological, it's um, social, and it's really, it's existential. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. And what got me when I was reading, because I'd been a motorcyclist for, I don't know, 20 years when I read it, is that it sort of it was my voice you, you actually expressed you know what I had always tried to do when I came across somebody who really was curious about motorcycling mm -hmm. you know and even some of my motorcycling friends when I tried to talk to them about you know just how deep it goes because they might only experience it in a very narrow way so I thought that was just such a nice insight and it was so literary in how you wrote it and with the prose was beautiful over the years a lot of Men have given that book to the women in their lives that mm -hmm. they wanted to do, to encourage um, to ride. You know, see, here's mm -hmm. here's another woman who does it, and also to say this is why it's such an important part of my life, and why I want you to share that. I don't know how well it's worked as as a. Um, a tool of persuasion and maybe it shouldn't work that well because I don't know that everybody should be riding and a lot of times people come to me um, and say I have this little nagging doubt in my mind about whether or not I should ride um, can you you know encourage me somehow and I say actually mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that because I do think if there's something inside that you that says eh, I don't think so um, or you know I've already taken the um, beginning MSF course and I was actually scared or I didn't really get it or it didn't feel that good I want to say then that's that's the voice you should listen to that says, you know what, it's not for, it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Not everything can be for everyone. That's right. And I, when I was teaching MSF beginners, oftentimes um, uh, women would come with their husbands. And 
oftentimes I'd ask them, I'd say, you know, why are you here? You know, so I'd ask anybody that. And they'd say, well, because my husband wants me to ride. And I, I kind of always had that little bit of a, you know, a twinge of, hmm, mm -hmm. that's not a great reason to ride. Yeah, exactly. It, I really think it needs to come, it needs to feed something in you. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, it clicked immediately, you know, was, I, I describe in the book, it was, the class was over two weekends, and after the first weekend, I went home and I said to my boyfriend, okay, I'm ready to shop for a bike. And he said, well, don't you wanna wait for the next class? I, well, wait for what? I don't need to wait. I, don't, I just knew that yeah. this was something I wanted to do that felt, it, it felt right. Nice. So um, talk to us a little bit about being a woman, and, and it seems to be a theme we've had going on in, this, in Riding in the Zone um, interviews. Uh, what thoughts might you have about women who are considering getting into riding, your experience as a woman in, in motorcycling, typically a male-dominated field? Well, recently an interviewer asked me that, how, you know, how I feel looking back on the experience of starting riding at a time when women were, um, you know, far less well represented than they are today. And I had to say that my experience of riding isn't gendered because it was, you know, this physical person on a motorcycle. So, and I only know how it feels to be a woman. So um, I can't speak to it. You know, it was people looking at me from the outside whose perception was gendered, mm -hmm. not mine. Mm -hmm. um, how women are perceived from uh, by others, that's an interesting question. I do think it's, you know, when we're seen doing things, then that makes it acceptable, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, if, if, they're, if you're the first woman that anybody's ever seen on a motorcycle, it can be a shock mm -hmm. and I, you know, all women have encountered that mm -hmm. surprise um, among certain sectors of society or other places that you go riding. Though they literally can't believe what they're seeing. Yeah, you know, it's like you rode that here. Yeah. I apparently yes. Yeah. You know, here I am. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think I ride like a woman. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. What would that mean? You know. Yeah. And that's something that you know there. Uh, women are a really big part of the growing the growth of motorcycling right now, and the competence of women I don't think is in question f for anybody who's paying attention. I mean, for those that are really kind of stuck in the traditional roles, you know, they're, they're, it's hard for them to admit that that's the case. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has an interesting project. It's called Global Women Who Ride, mm -hmm. and she uh, brings stories of women riding all over the world, and especially in those cultures mm -hmm. where there's um, a sometimes pretty serious prescription, um, and there are, there are women, there are young girls who um, are now riding at risk mm -hmm. of fairly serious punishment, mm -hmm. um, but because they want to do it that much, they're willing to, um, to take that on, and that to me is hugely inspirational, mm -hmm. and it also speaks, I think, to the power of riding. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing I wanted to also point out about the idea of like, if you're really not, it, you're not, it's not speaking to you about riding, that that is a, a very important thing that the risk is high. The reward has to be higher. Yes, right? mm -hmm. yes, I was explaining that to my son because I, he's um, 18 and recently got his driver's license. And one of the things that riding a motorcycle has done, I believe firmly, is made me a far safer mm -hmm. car driver. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, as soon as he gets his license, I want him to either do a track day mm -hmm. or to, um, you know, I'll just, not for purposes necessarily of riding a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. If it clicks with him, great. But get him into that class um, because it teaches, um, you know, defensive, you know, a defensive attitude on the road that is useful for anybody. And so I was explaining to him, you know, honey, if you got into that class and you just felt it like this is this is for me. Mm -hmm. This feels right. It feels good. I love the, I love this sensation. Mm -hmm. Then then I'm willing to undergo it, you know, but 
for me, I, I can only take that risk for myself. I can't, I can't tell anybody else that they should. Mm -hmm. I want you to, you know, you should go out and, um, you know, expose yourself to a higher level of danger than, mm -hmm. than other people. Yeah, with my daughter, who's now 28, um, she's an avid motorcyclist, and that was when she was at that age, um, I really said, do you really want to do this? Mm -hmm. Because if not, you know, I just assume you not do it. It's, it can be pretty risky. And she, of course, was all in and she's gone in very deep. She's found how deep the well is. Right. So, and yeah. obviously, obviously it works for her. And, and I think it's sort of organization of your brain and your, you know, your, your physical attributes that mm -hmm. sometimes meshes with, with motorcycles because they're an extension of your body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There, it's, um, I wrote, I wrote a piece recently for uh, a British magazine about how a motorcycle fits you and the motorcycle that fits you the best is the one that disappears. Mm -hmm. um, that you, if you feel it too much, mm -hmm. I mean, what we long for, I think, is that sensation where it's no longer there and it's just us in connection with, um, you know, kinetic, mm -hmm movement and, and the world, mm -hmm. but I don't really feel my motorcycle under me unless it doesn't really fit very well. <laughs> yeah, there's some motorcycles that, that feel that you can connect with much quicker and easier than others. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually brings up a point about when I, we were talking about this electric motorcycle I rode. Mm -hmm. When I took away, when it took away the sort of visceral feeling of an internal combustion engine and it was an electric motor and the sounds uh, were gone, I felt very much like I was floating and flying. I wondered about how that would how that would feel because to me a you know a big part of it because I guess maybe because this is all I've ever experienced on two wheels is is that um, vibration and the you know, you, f you feel when the gears engage and, you know, there's the ka mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and the sound. And I think we respond to different motorcycle sounds. Um, you know, it resonates in our body. They all have different vibration patterns and, and noise and stuff. And that, to me, is why I, you know, fell in love with Italian motorcycles mm -hmm. is the sound they produce. Yeah, so you had Moto Guzzi's, I remember, right? Yeah. So do you, what do you have for bikes now in your garage? Well, I, I have three, which is like, you know, unprecedented riches because for years and years I just had one. And so it was like, if that one bike didn't start, I wasn't going riding. And now I can go into the garage and say, hmm, do I want to ride my new Moto Guzzi? Or do I want to ride my BMW? Well, different, you know, they're different bikes. They're set up differently. There's, everything about them is different. So um, when I'm going on a long highway trip, when I was coming here, it was going to be mainly on the slab, as we say. So um, I want my, you know, my comfortable, more powerful, you know, windscreen, all that kind of stuff. But when I'm going out, um, on the back roads. I think it's very telling which motorcycle you are drawn to for a certain, you know, if I could be on this bike all the time, mm -hmm. I'd choose this one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I'm tooling around the mountain roads where I live, I want to be on my Moto Guzzi because it just feels mm -hmm. like, it feels like the dancing partner yeah. that I want at that moment. And that's an analogy I often use you know, with my students particularly is, Try to associate that motorcycle as your dance partner, mm -hmm. and then you start to you know feel how you're interacting with it. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got the BMW. It's an R1150. 50R. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the Guzzi is what? It's a new uh, V7. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, two. It? It's it's red and yeah. black and white, <laughs> and I still have also the um, Lario that I was given by um, a very special group of people who actually didn't know me at the time. Um, I had sold the, the Lario that I had written about in The Perfect Vehicle, and that was, that was the, the motorcycle of my heart. But sometimes life takes us in different places. I was moving into 
sort of a non-motorcycle phase of my life, and also I couldn't fix <laughs> the problems mm -hmm. that were starting to crop up in that bike. And so I sadly sold it. And then it was one of those things that I know a lot of people get to, um, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. Why did I do that? Something is missing from my life. You know, really, it feels that deep. There's something is gone, something missing. And then, um, you know, many, many people also have certain types of personal crises that call into question everything that preceded. And I had one of those. And this group of motorcyclists in New England got wind of it and because they're, you know, the the the, the Guzisti are a very tight <laughs> band for, for various reasons yeah. we need to be. Um, and they heard this and they, when I got back into riding, I bought a BMW um, and they didn't, they thought there was something very much the matter with me on a BMW and they found a Lario for sale and they restored it and gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most profound and moving um, episodes in my life. Mm -hmm. There's there's nothing to compare to that. that. I mean, it's a it was a gift of the heart. Um, and it, to me, it exemplifies um, how deep motorcycles and motorcycling can be in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of us, our, our true brethren, are you know the people we feel bonded to um, more tightly sometimes than blood are other motorcyclists and the question of why that should be is the one that I want to explore in my writing because I think it's a very interesting ultimately not even social question but it's a it's a human question mm. it's mm. a species question mm. that's interesting there uh, have been conversations about how um, Polar, there can be polarization in, in amongst the motorcycling community mm -hmm. and that you know that doesn't make a lot of sense when you start thinking about um, that we are experiencing this this thing uh, that we are, it's a very special thing yeah. and so that's something that even though we ride one type of motorcycle or another um, we do identify because sometimes it's because this motorcycle does something that other motorcycles don't Mm -hmm. And the Guzzi, I know when I've ridden them, there's nothing like, there's nothing right. like a Moto Guzzi, right? right? Yeah. They're so cool. And the Lario is like a special, you know, that's for those who don't know, that's an 80s, was it 88, 87? Uh, 87. 87. So it's, it, they're not, you know, they're pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So for them to find one and then to restore it, yeah. that's pretty special. Very, very, very special. And I will never get rid uh, of that bike. No, you can't. That would yeah. be, that's, that's no. beautiful. And I, I saw their photos of, of your original Lario is in the book. Right? Mm -hmm. Now you wrote a second book, the um, man who wouldn't. The man who would stop, stop at, nothing. at nothing. And that's about long distance riding. Right? Yeah, extreme long distance riding. When I discovered that there are people out there doing these insane pileups of mileage, you know, you you start you you get out your calculator and you go, but but that's not humanly possible mm -hmm. to do 1,500 miles in 24 hours, mm -hmm. and not only just one of those, but there are people who are doing whole strings of them. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, wow, maybe there is something more to explore in riding because um, it seemed to me to be a distillation, you know, a, a, a sort of a. a purification of what motorcycling really is, to be so driven and so passionate as to want to do nothing else mm -hmm. in this yeah. world but yeah. that. I associate it with the long distance runner or ice fishing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you have to ask, you know, you're never gonna exactly. get it, right? Exactly, exactly. So I, but, I, but I have this thing in me that I want to explain, mm -hmm. and it's a way really of getting down into it myself. I only through the act of writing do I actually mm -hmm. finally learn what I think about something. Um, it's just, I guess it is sort of a, it is like motorcycling itself. It's mm -hmm. something you have to do. You can't talk about it, you can't think about it. Finally, you, you comprehend mm -hmm. in the act of doing. So that's what, to me, uh, writing is. And I just really wanted to try to understand. And it's this whole subculture, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like they've got their secret codes mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's an amazing world that 
if if outsiders really knew what was going on, <laughs> you know. And and the Iron Bud Association doesn't necessarily want you to know exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, because they don't want to be shut down. But they are, um, you know, pound for pound, the safest riders mm -hmm. there are because yeah. they're doing, uh, you know, massive miles and. Um, you know, in a thing like the Iron Butt Rally, there are very, very, very few um, accidents. Yeah, and the Iron Butt is, uh, uh, remind me of what the mileage is and it's the requirements? It's 11, it, you, roughly speaking, it's 11,000 miles over 11 days. Right. And once you, it, all while you are, um, you know, looking for bonus points, and that helps organize the experience, so it's not just going out onto the highways and just, you know, running up the clock, it's, you have to stay, um, you know, on top of things enough to follow, you know, to route yourself on the most efficient route to get the big bonus points and then you have to log everything and take photographs and have the evidence and it's a massive mm -hmm. undertaking. Yeah, I've known a few people who've done it and I, mm -hmm. I scratch my head. I know. You know. Of all the things that I've done and want to do, that's not one not of them. Not one of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I dabbled in it a little bit. I did I did a, a 24 hour rally um, and, you know, rode pretty much for 22 hours straight, mm -hmm. which um, is something that was very hard for me to do and probably not uh, advisable, but I felt I needed to do it, mm -hmm. I needed to have that experience, and once you're in it, it, it for me it was very hard to say, uh, with my goal in sight, I actually should get off the road. Mm -hmm. And I should have, mm -hmm. there's no, no question about that, but I, I got lucky. And I think like exploring that sort of thing it helps you find your limits, your own personal limits, and obviously the physical limits, but even your psychological and, and exactly. uh, emotional it's limits. Exactly, it's everything, right? it's yeah. everything. I mean, motorcycling's that way, I mean it really, is a conduit for accessing places that you're not going to access uh, otherwise. I suppose there are other other ways of doing it, but motorcycling just has this universal um, uh, an opportunity for people to start to really understand themselves in a lot of ways. I know camping, long you know, distance camping is one of my things that when I first discovered that, mm -hmm. it was like me and my motorcycle. I'm talking yeah. about more than a day's way f you know f from home. Like if something were to happen, I couldn't be home that night. Mm -hmm. And that started to really give me a sense of, wow, you know, I'm connected to this machine. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It becomes your lifeline mm -hmm. or, or your friend or, I mean, I don't really personify my motorcycle. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I know it's not a person. It doesn't even have a name. But um, it, it's like, it's like a, you know, your comrades in arms mm -hmm. or something. That's, it's something you, you depend on. Mm -hmm. And that's why you want to take good care of your motorcycle. Right, and learn how to work on it. Exactly. <laughs> we were talking about that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, as we wrap up, anything else you'd like to share? Uh, we have motorcycle riders and non-motorcycle riders are going to be watching this. Anything mm -hmm. you'd like to? I just, I think that the more that I do it, the more that I think that motorcycling is, um, a truly profound reflection of what it means to live. Mm -hmm. I think it's sort of a metaphor in action in a lot of ways. And I sometimes feel when I'm riding along that, oh my gosh, I'm in possession of one of the great secrets, mm -hmm. you know, that's out in full view, but nobody really knows the, the interior value um, unless you do it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so anybody who really is interested in riding a motorcycle, um, you can ask people that you know that, uh, that ride, a neighbor or whatnot. Um, we always encourage you to take a beginner rider course, right? Always. Always. So the Motorcycle Safety Foundation, MSF, uh, they are, are active in all the states. There's also Total Control is, is uh, another organization. Um, that that's the way that you can go there. They'll supply the motorcycles, they'll supply helmets, and you can actually get a taste for of what it's about. And like you were saying earlier, get a feel for whether it really speaks to you or not, because it doesn't speak to everybody. Now, those of you who like who have been riding forever and you just sort of think, well, I just like to ride on the weekends, that's cool. But I bet you you can relate to an awful lot of what Melissa's been talking about, that it's that special sort of connection that you've got. Well, that's been great. This has been really terrific having you, Melissa. Thanks. Great. All right. So that's it. Another episode of Riding in the Zone. We will be back soon. Thank you for coming. Okay.